Serge, why don't you why don't you go ahead and okay. Go ahead. okay. So it's uh, really our great pleasure to to welcome here uh, Georges Carniadiakis. So Georges is from Crete, uh, received his degrees from uh, MIT. And, and there are many things to say about George. So he's a he's fellow of several society like uh, SIAM, uh, American Physical Society as well, American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Um, and he received uh, recently a, a SIAM prize on computational sciences and engineering. Um, so we invited George because we are very much interested in the in the approximation properties of uh, neural networks and especially for, for pins. And it's one of the very important works George did in the recent years. So George, the floor is yours. And thank you very much for, for being with us this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sergio. Let me uh, uh, share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. And uh, now it's in uh, presentation mode. Uh, you can see the movie, right? Yes, the coffee. Yeah. Thank you very much for the uh, for this opportunity. I also like to talk to thank uh, Thomas Serif, my colleague from Brown, who uh, introduced me to to your institute, and I'll be happy to uh, talk with you afterwards and uh, work in the future with you. As I said, Toulouse is a great place <laughs> for me to visit. Uh, so um, I want to talk about um, how we use neural networks to approximate the functions and functionals and also operators and different applications. But I would like to start with this um, um, problem. I work with uh, lots of experimentalists over uh, the years. This, this experiment, I like it a lot because I convince uh, this company, this German company, La Vision, to do this for free for me. And I was always interested to see, you know, what are the properties of coffee over the cup, the espresso. I, I drink lots of espresso every day, so like you do, guys. So anyway, they set up this uh, nice experiment. You can see multiple cameras. Uh, and basically with these cameras, they do what's called Slytherin photography, something that uh, people used to do in high-speed aerodynamics in the 60s to capture shocks and so on. Now, of course, it's color and so on. So they can do a 3D a reconstruction of the of the plume over the cup of uh, espresso and basically what this represents is thermal gradients so my job was to infer from thermal gradients uh, of the density sorry thermal uh, thermal gradients of, uh, of temperature density but thermal gradients in, in general my job is to infer the velocity field in 3d and time and also the pressure over that now as you can see, that's an ill pose inverse problem. I don't have the properties. Uh, I probably know only the temperature in the in the room, and that's it. And uh, so that's, I wanted to set this up as a problem that I don't think we can solve with existing methods. And, and I have developed lots of different methods over the years, but uh, I don't think I could I could do that with uh, without what I will talk about uh, next. Now, I give lots of talks, and 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 uh, there's always this talk why you abandon spectral elements, finite elements, and why you want to do to solve uh, partial differential equations with uh, neural networks. Uh, uh, There's so many problems and so on. So, and the answer is yes. So let me just um, prelude this with um, a couple of slides. So if we go back to early nineties and the um, uh, universal function approximation by say Pengo and Mascar and Hornick and others, uh, of course, they were talking about a single uh, neural network, but basically uh, they um, had an approximation of, uh, which looks like this for this shallow neural network. Uh, w will be the weights uh, here of, of the linear part. And then you have uh, this uh, fine transformation and you have sigma. And sigma, of course, has to be what they call a discriminatory function. And that would be like a sigmoid. Today we use... Um, hyperbolic tangents instead, uh, other activation functions that I will talk about, but certainly not a polynomial. So it's a non-polynomial approximation uh, that uh, we have here. And then, of course, the universal approximation uh, theorem says that we can, um, we can uh, 
approximate this function accurately with arbitrary accuracy. Um, in practice, if you try to model, to um, approximate a sign, instead of three Chebyshev polynomials, you would actually need 10,000 neurons in here. So it's not really very practical, not expressive. So in addition, the, this set of all functions uh, that does not form a vector space because of this nonlinearity sigma. So we cannot really say something that that uh, some, something like uh, do the same analysis we do for for finite elements in terms of the theory anyway. Um, so, uh, but what is good about it? Well, the deeper neural networks, as as we know now, they are very expressive. And also, I would like to present this um, adaptive basis viewpoint for this deeper neural network. So let's, let's consider, for example, only the hidden layers here. And then let's isolate the linear part here at the end. And what you can see here uh, in this expression, I can write my neural network parameterized by theta as a linear combination of this basis phi. And this basis phi is basically this last on this last layer, the last hidden layer, last nonlinear layer. And, and these are the linear weights. So, so this now gives us a, um, an, a, an alternative interpretation, if you like, because we can think of uh, the neural network, uh, given some data, it produces a, a adaptive basis phi, and then we take a linear combination of that, and we can go on and do actually Galerkin projections or whatever we want with, uh, with that. And people are starting realizing that this could also be a way to solve PDs. We're not going to do that here, but I'm just trying to, to, to tell you that uh, some motivation why one would do that. And, and, uh, and just to, to make the point here, in our courses, we, we, we always show this Range function, which of course has a singularity in the complex plane. And a good Fourier approximation here will not do it because at the end we get this uh, with equidistant nodes. So instead, we, we, uh, have, we have to have special points to approximate this function, but you can see here that with lots of Chebyshev points, I don't get a good approximation of this simple, very simple function. Uh, maybe uh, deceptively simple. Uh, well, if I, on the other hand, if I use a neural network uh, and I increase the depth, as you can see, I go from uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five layers, you can see uh, with arbitrary distribution of the points, I can actually get, um, uh, a very good approximation uh, of uh, of the function in other points that uh, that I'm testing. So so there is this expressivity of neural networks, and this nonlinear approximation could help us in uh, in these situations of uh, uh, singularities, uh, uh, discontinuities, and so on. Uh, I, I talked about finite elements, and I wanted also to make this point that um, uh, there is now theory that shows how we can relate this to finite elements approximation, certainly in 1D, it's straightforward to see that if you take the hat function that we use the, uh, for linear finite elements, this hat function can be written exactly like a ReLU. And then finally, at, in 1D, you can argue that these, uh, the space is similar to the neural uh, uh, networks. I will go back to this point later, and I will talk about the Galerkin methods using neural networks and, and smooth functions like polynomials. But, but I wanted to sort of um, uh, preempty kind of, uh, of the skepticism. Why and we are, why not do we use this this type of uh, methods? Now, the real motivation actually for me was to um, I, I work with lots of experimentalists. If you work with experimentalists, you know that their data is not big, is not precise. In fact, is dinky, which means small, dirty, uh, which means noisy, dynamic, which means streaming video, and um, uh, and since this this uh, statement was given to me by the army. They said the enemy is always there, so we may have deceptive data, which we interpret as adversarial data. So, so that's the 5D law for data. What do you do with that? So the old paradigm, of course, is this one. Okay, uh, in applied math, we like to solve well-posed problems, uh, have very uh, specific and, and idealized boundary conditions, and initial conditions. However, in real life, as I said, what we have is this middle case where we know some of the physics, and we have some data, and the data may not necessarily be where we want them. In other words, may not be at the boundary conditions, may not be at the inlets, and so on. Uh, so, so to this 
uh, and I will present the physics informed neural network. Uh, more recently, we have been working on operator regression or neural operators. And with neural operators, you can do a lot of things that you can do with pins, but, but of course you learn at the operator level. In addition, you can identify black box systems. For example, today everybody's talking about digital twins, systems of systems, complex systems for which you may not be able to write down all the equations. An example is um, uh, social dynamics. Uh, we don't have governing laws for social dynamics. Uh, DeepoNet, uh, which I will uh, introduce as a, new, as, uh, as a neural operator, in fact, the first neural operator in the literature can do that, can identify black box systems and then can make predictions in, in real time. So um, let me introduce this um, physics informed neural network idea. Uh, we did this work a long time ago, but as you know, every new idea uh, is rejected at, the, uh, at first. So it took, a, it took us a while to publish it actually. And since we published it, it's the most cited paper in general computational physics, for example. But, but the, the reason the, it was rejected in the beginning was because they, the idea is very, very simple. So let me explain the idea. So we have a standard neural network. Uh, we have coordinates x1 and x2, and we're trying to find u1 and u2, let's say, in some mechanics uh, application. And but just let's concentrate on the left part now, uh, just simply by minimizing the L2 norm. We can minimize the H1 norm. We can minimize lots of uh, different quantities. But the standard thing is the regression is to do a minimization like least squares. And, and, and um, uh, if you have enough data, uh, then we can find uh, all these connections, which are basically the weights and the bias. Sigma here, again, is the nonlinear non activation function. So it's very, very simple. There's nothing um, fancy. This is how I, I compute this function I showed you earlier. Of course, in science and engineering, we don't have 10,000 measurements to do this. We have three measurements, five measurements, scatter measurements, dinky, noisy data, as I said. So instead, we have physical laws. Now, how do we integrate this? Well, first of all, we extend this network to be, so this is now the same parameter, parameterized network, theta. And we say that U1 and U2 also have to satisfy some physical laws. In this case, for example, it will be the momentum equation. I'm looking at, um, at mechanics applications or fluid mechanics will be the same. So, so we want F1 and F2 either to match the forces. So if we have equilibrium, F1 and F2 will be um, zero. So, uh, so how do we integrate that? Well, if, if you follow neural networks, you know that uh, we have this automatic differentiation is a key tool that uh, Google and, uh, and the other big boys um, derived and, and, and uh, uh, it's a free tool. So with automatic differentiation, uh, you need to take the partial derivatives of the objective function with respect to the loss function with respect to the weights. We use the same automatic differentiation to construct these operators and therefore express the physical laws. In other words, this is where we are departing from the standard uh, approach of numerical methods because uh, we use automatic differentiation and therefore we don't need to do spectral expansions. We don't need to do finite differences or finite elements. We don't need to build a grid. We abandon, we remove the tyranny of having to generate meshes. Imagine you're trying to generate a, um, a, a mesh around the wing of, a, of an Airbus um, right there next in, in, in your city. So that, that's a very tedious uh, job. It takes months. Uh, here, you don't need to do that. You will evaluate this. Uh, first of all, you want to, to have another residual, uh, minimizing this to zero. So then your loss function will be the data plus the physics. So we can also put some weights here. We can call lambda data and lambda physics, and I will get back to this later. So in other words, you can take a weighted sum. If you get to this point, then you use standard off-the-shelf minimizers to find uh, uh, the minimum. So the key, I guess, here is that the simplicity of this, that we have one parameter uh, space. And in, in fact, what we do with by doing this automatic differentiation on the operators is like every time you take a derivative, it's like you take a deeper, you double approximately the size of, uh, of, the, of the depth of this uh, neural network. Uh, let me demonstrate this for a very simple problem. Again, it's a homework problem for our students. 
this is the Bergen's equation, but it has all the ingredients that I want here. So first of all, we don't discretize space time. These are continuous variables, and therefore we, ab we avoid having dispersion errors, artificial diffusion errors, and so on. Then we need data. Where's the data? The data here, if I solve a forward problem, the data will be the initial conditions, and then the boundary conditions. Now here's the boundary conditions, and you can see that, and deliberately, I take only a few points on the boundaries. For example, here, around 0.4 in time, I have a big gap where I don't provide boundary conditions. Well, right there, any other method, spectral method or, um, or any method would fail because you don't have data at the boundaries and you can't take a big jump. That's not a problem here. Uh, this can be handled. So I have a little TensorFlow code here to show you that uh, we can define the, the left part of the network, the data, just like that. And then here, we take the TensorFlow gradients in time and space to construct these derivatives and this derivatives and this derivative, and then we add it up. So this term here represents the all the terms, uh, all the, that's the data term, all the black points. Now this term here is the residual that I'm trying to make to zero. So this, this has to be F. Uh, it will be evaluated at point, at some point. What points? Well, the points will be, I, I draw the points, I don't know if you can see them, inside the domain randomly, and, and that's where, how I do it. 10 minutes later, a high school student can produce a result which looks like this. Not a bad result, because this is not a trivial solution. Usually we study to show to our students that we have Gibbs oscillations, but here you can see this not, and, and now you can think of the adaptive uh, basis viewpoint that I, I described, this adaptive uh, basis could de detect this sharp gradient. Uh, it could be a, sh a shock if, if the viscosity goes to zero, this viscosity here, uh, but, but it's a very, very steep gradient and that will give you uh, give rise to Gibbs oscillations. This we avoided. So it's very, very simple, as I said. Now, this was the original idea. You can actually make it more powerful, more appropriate for applications. You can also uh, and I know you're interested in, in parallel computing uh, at, the, at the Institute, you can also do it really, really fast and, uh, and uh, almost embarrassingly uh, uh, parallel, not, not, not quite, but so here's an, here's an example. So we combine now the pin idea with the composition in space time. Again, this is space, this is time, and I can decompose the whole domain into two domains. Domain one is this dolphin. I'm looking at the same problem. Uh, here I just uh, show off um, that uh, to, to demonstrate that the decomposition in space-time could be arbitrary. So I can have a dolphin shape domain and I, have, I can have the other domain two, which has a hole, okay? Now in the first domain, I assign in a, a, a certain neural network with, which has this hyperbolic tangent, that's where the shock will be. And then outside here in the blue sea, I, just, I uh, have another uh, smaller size, say, um, neural network. I can optimize those independently. I can produce solutions. Now the question is, how do you stitch those two do domains together? But remember the residual, which I call earlier F, the residual inside the domain of dolphin and outside has to be continuous. So I penalize that with another, let's say, lambda interface. So so this is a Lagrangian multiplier, and and I and I try to minimize. Uh, because the, uh, the residual is zero, therefore continues. And you can see, in fact, uh, with very little effort, you can get good solutions. But this, of course, gives you great flexibility because you can you can have, let's say, two neural networks on two different GPUs running at the same time. We have done this to up to 128 now, uh, different GPUs, and the um, scalability is pretty good. Now, you need some theory to say when would you use this extended version, which we call X pin versus pin. And it's not so simple, right? Because so we have a, we have a paper down here that I uh, uh, that, that it's on, uh, on the archive that shows we analyze theoretically this problem using the baron spaces. If you don't know what the baron spaces are, um, uh, these have been proposed by Wine and E from Princeton and others as the right spaces. Uh, to, um, um, to have this mixed problem where we have these nonlinear approximations. In this particular case, we extend, we extend to deep neural networks, so we have a recursive definition of baron spaces. And then we need the baron norms to, for each subdomain to see when that norm is large, uh, we have to split the domain. So one can do this 
sort of uh, decomposition. Um, there are other uh, issues, there are lots of issues. In fact, there are hundreds and thousands of papers now written on, on pins that are trying to improve this original idea. Uh, this one here, I show it, it comes from uh, a guy I call uh, Clever Ulysses. He's not Greek, he's, uh, he's Brazilian from Texas A&M, but him and his student came up with a great idea. And they're looking at a French equation, the Boussines, the, what's called the bad Boussines equation uh, here we're looking at. And, and in the loss function, I said, you can add the boundary conditions, the initial conditions, the equations, other constraints and so on. So let's weight them. And, and the weights here would be a function of space, for example, a space and time. And now he made those weights to be trainable, hyperparameters, just like the weights and the bias in the affine approximation. So this Boussinet solution, as you can see here, it's not trivial. It has this uh, type of structure. It's a way of sec second order derivative in time, fourth derivative in space. But the interesting thing about the, uh, the weights, you don't have to specify it, they are self-adaptive self weights. Uh, and they look like the solution. They basically follow the, the solution. So the weights can tell you how would you refine if you want to sprinkle more points and so on. Another idea that we advance in my group and this goes beyond uh, PDEs and pins. It, it applies to all neural networks. Uh, it's this idea of uh, neural networks firing with different um, activation functions. So the activation functions will be adaptive. In fact, what we did here is to have um, not only adaptive activation functions, but uh, every neuron could have its own um, let's say, a, a activation function. And, and these activation functions will have parameters, will parameterize, be parameterized so that, that these parameters are trainable. So we call this the Kronecker delta, the Kronecker neural network, because we use a Kronecker product to construct this decomposition here. I don't have the details to, 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 to here to show you, but, but the main idea is that uh, if you look at this is the vector of phi one to phi k, uh, I, let these being parameters, trainable parameters that will be learned by the data. So you can see here what I do. I have a, uh, let's say hyperbolic tension. I could start with that, but then I superimpose, I call those the rowdy, the noisy uh, activation functions. It has been shown in the literature empirically that if you add noise to the activation functions, you avoid uh, locking into a plateau in the optimization algorithm, which is of course the big computational bottleneck. We actually have a theorem that shows that if you use adaptive activation functions, you're never going to get locked into a bad minimum. The theorem does not guarantee you'll find the global minimum, of course, it, it this uh, non-convex high dimensional optimization problem, but we guarantee that we'll not uh, get locked into a, a, bad, a bad minimum. We have some other theory about this, at least for the two layer neural network or this chronic neural uh, network is that we show that the, the, if we compare this with a feed forward neural network, the Kronecker neural network will always converge faster, at least for some time initially. Uh, also the convergence itself is exponential. You can see here so under some mild conditions that are always uh, true in practice. And I have some results, not from pins, but actually from standard computer science. Standard problems in computer science, like for example, the um, NIST, uh, the various versions of NIST, the SVHN, uh, the CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100, both the training loss and the, and the, and the test loss, uh, you can see the green curve, which corresponds to this uh, rowdy activation functions, we beat the state of the art. No matter what method you're using, we beat them just using this very simple. It's a little more expensive, of course, to learn these uh, ways, but not uh, uh, overlay prohibitive. As I said, this method is very simple. And even young students like this, high school student. This is a high school student. Uh, he wrote this paper with uh, me and uh, Lulu, one of my former students recently. Uh, he's from Texas and he gave this talk through Zoom to my group recently, uh, just before his English class. And um, of course, he's a special student. He's like this French uh, high school students who know lots of math. And so he, he modified the uh, loss function. So he added the term here, uh, the um, gradient of the loss. 
The reason you want to have the gradient of the loss is because if you pin down the solution at some points, just like in spectral collocation method, in between the points, the solution may oscillate. If you penalize the gradient, then you can get uh, a better convergence. And in, indeed, uh, uh, this 17 year old beat all my postdocs. Uh, this is a diffusion reaction equation. This is his result. This is the pin. Uh, he also gets good, good uh, results for the uh, derivatives. Here is the derivative in next, the derivative in time, and so on. So there's lots of ideas out there. Uh, I would like to go back to the coffee example and show you how we can extract the velocity and the pressure. So we published this paper in, in science a couple of years ago uh, in hidden fluid mechanics. And uh, the challenge was to, similar to the coffee example, in other words, you have some sort of flow uh, downstream of an object but you don't know that the object is there. You only have a video of a dye visualization. It could be a smoke visualization. It could be cloud, cloud visualization for, for weather. What can you learn from that? Because right now that we cannot learn anything. So, so what we did is to, uh, I challenged my postdocs, so they came up with this uh, pin. This is now uh, an equation for the passive scalar. Uh, here, the material parameters like the Peclet number uh, it may not be known. You can learn from the data. The range number is not known. You can learn from the data, but they have the Navier-Stokes equations, constraints like divergence-free constraints, and the passive scalar would, would uh, basically see, uh, mimic this dye visualization at an unknown um, the clear number. But by matching the dye itself, the passive scalar, you can and, and having one network, you can see here is one parameter parameterized network theta. You find theta, then easily you can find you extract the velocity field and the pressure field for free. You can even find forces on the body just from visualization if you have the dye going around the body. So that's very powerful. That's why it was published there. Um, you can apply this to eye brain aneurysms. Um, it's, it's a bad thing to have. I hope no, nobody has that. But but what the doctor sees now in the, in the brain arteries is something like that. They put a contrast, contrasting agent, so you see black and white a video of something like that, they cannot do anything. Well, we demonstrated that we can actually take the dye just inside the aneurysm. This is a dilated artery, it's a real data. So what you can have here is, again, you, you interface this with a model, you couple it to a model of uh, non-Newtonian uh, fluids, and then you can find the stresses and you can find the um, pressure uh, from the, uh, I have a movie here I want to show you, um, which is a verification with the CFD solver. So we can learn very accurately the flow just inside the aneurysmal sac and do it very accurately just from this black and white data visualization. The same thing is from coffee. What is given basically is a 3D reconstruction of, of the temperature field uh, above the coffee uh, the espresso cup. And then we match that. So this is the idea to make this difference as small as possible. That's the data. Then the auxiliary data uh, is this. We call it hidden fluid mechanics because it's like a, loosely speaking, a hidden Markov process. You can think of the auxiliary variable being what is the data, and then the primary variables would be the uh, velocity and the pressure that you are interested. So this has been verified with experiments and so on. And, but uh, the reason La Vision decided to do this experiment is because just in the beginning of the pandemic, we found this video uh, their video uh, two years ago now uh, on um, on YouTube. So we downloaded the video and I asked my postdoc, can you actually use this video to say how big is the velocity field around the mouth of my now collaborator, Thomas Berg from Gettigen. And, um, and indeed we found the pressure. Uh, you can see the pressure puff as the real data. And also we could measure, uh, we could uh, infer the velocity field everywhere just from minimalistic information from the web. So uh, you can see here without the mask and with the mask, you contain basically you reduce the speed by a factor of 10 times. So even, even now, two years later, we have to wear our masks. The other problems I want to tease you with is um, this is our latest application. So the problem here is controlling 256 drones, 256 drones. This problem I don't think has ever been done. So the, the drones are here on the walls of a room and they try to cross across. And they try to do it in the, sh in the shorter amount of time. 
without any collisions. So I will let the movie play maybe a little like, so they go from the wall and they try to cross to the opposite wall. And that's a very, very difficult problem. So, so basically we're looking at the Hamilton Jacobi PD in 512 dimensions because it's two dimensional space. So I have 512 dimensions. And so what we did is we use a symplectic integrator, something we developed earlier called simp nets. Um, we map the trajectories into simpler trajectories uh, in time. And then we uh, use the Hamilton Jacobi, we use pins for the Hamilton Jacobi equations to solve that problem and learn it in the simpler, uh, with simpler coordinates. So that takes about a, a one hour with our new Ampere 100 GPUs on single GPU. And so that, that sort of um, attract a lot of interest from uh, various uh, uh, constituents. We can also develop uh, new equations and people have, lots of people have, lots of groups have looked at uh, developing new equations. Given the data, you can have pure data driven approaches or you can put constraints into it. I like to put prior knowledge uh, and that knowledge could be the PD, but of course here we're trying to discover the PD or the OD, how would you do it? So again, the certain principles you can, you can use. For example, uh, in this formulation, it's called generic formulation developed by Ottinger at ETH. Um, uh, it applies to thermodynamics and energy at the same time. The energy equation in thermodynamics is mathematized. So Z here and Z dot are the trajectories uh, of, um, of this, uh, let's say a dynamical system. And E is the energy, S is the entropy. Now in this, theoretical formulation, uh, we have to have these constraints. And these constraints have to be hard coded. So this is an example where instead of putting these constraints as soft constraints like Lagrangian multipliers or many Lagrangian multipliers, we will actually build a new architecture which will have four networks, one for E, one for S, and then for this auxiliary um, quantities L and M, and L and M have certain properties that we would like to honor. And basically I built a new uh, architecture from con consist of consisting of four neural networks, which uh, will have these uh, constraints uh, uh, exactly done. Now I don't have time to explain all this. This uh, GFIN is actually on the archive. Uh, it will appear soon in the proceedings of uh, Royal Society. But uh, it turns out that you can actually learn the system just from data, and then you can extrapolate. You can extrapolate for very complicated systems. For example, you can have two gases that, that you let them exchange volume and heat, or you can have two or pendula. These pendula are nonlinear and they are thermoelastic. Uh, so so we can, you can see here uh, the state of the art using actually the same technique as this, but, uh, but uh, having an architecture that has that hardwires these constraints can give you uh, a, a, a longer prediction, uh, a reasonable prediction period. These are, of course, uh, stochastic systems here. So you don't expect the, that you can, uh, uh, eventually the error will be order one. There are other developments. Um, for example, I talk about here solving PDs using a variation framework, not just a collocation framework that, uh, that we have, but one can combine the, uh, trial space of nonlinear neural networks with test functions, which will be, let's say polynomials, Legend polynomials and so on. So one can produce all sorts of different methods. So I, I would like to, to, to um, stop here um, on the uh, pins, the different versions about fractional PDs and, uh, and so on. But uh, 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 there's a library, I, uh, this DeepXD library um, has been downloaded uh, all, about over 200,000 times. It's and basically X stands for any PD. The, the library is both in Py, in, uh, in, in uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch and has a module for geometry. So you can solve integral equations, can solve uh, uh, all sorts of ODs, PDs, uh, and stochastic PDs and so on. Uh, there's a lot of success in the industry. A lot of companies start with just pins because everybody can understand it. Um, Unfortunately, I'm running behind, so I don't have time to explain to you that we have actually developed uh, Jerome Darbon, the Frenchman, is a, is a colleague of mine, he's an expert on optimization. We have uh, developed some theory that shows that indeed for elliptic and parabolic PDEs, 
we can actually have convergence in the L2 sense, even if we don't have boundary conditions. So boundary condi uh, if we have in boundary conditions, then we converge in, in H1 norm. We can also produce error estimates. I will skip that. Let me see how much time I have. Okay. The remaining of the time, I'll talk about the deponent, but I want to tease you with this simulation, which is the real destroyer going out in, um, uh, in a uh, sea state eight. If you're sailing, you know that sea state eight is very, very dangerous, waves of uh, 20 meters. And this is an autonomous destroyer by the US Navy. And uh, the idea is, of course, to be autonomous. Now, how would you do that? You need some, uh, not just cameras, you need also some processing in real time. And this simulation, which is quite impressive, was not done by me, it was done by my collaborator and MIT student who is very patient. It took about one week for one simulation. So given the spectrum, the stochastic spectrum, this is the Atlantic Ocean, uh, the elevation, can you find the six degrees of freedom of this? It's a very difficult problem because it, it, to solve it in detail, you have to do all the fluid, the structure interaction and so on. So it's expensive on, on uh, multi-CPU. Uh, so I thought maybe we could train a system to produce functionals, a functional of the motion here, the function of time, let's say the six degrees of freedom. So I was interested in that. And then I said, well, how, how, do, how can I do that? I don't like to, to just try things. And, and um, I ran into this beautiful theorem. I, I told you about, earlier about the theorem of Saipengo in the early 90s. This is actually a theorem from functionals by Chen and Chen from University of Fudan in Shanghai. And it tells us that indeed, single layer in neural networks, like the one that I show here, could approximate a, a functional in the compact set from A to B, if this functional is continuous. Notice here, U is the input function, which is sampled in M sensors. So a single hidden layer in one dimension, but also in N dimensions. Nobody did anything with this, I think, great paper. To me, it's sort of the best kept secret in an approximation theory because nobody ever cited it. I ran into it accidentally. Uh, and, and then I said, can I maybe, comp since I have the theorem now, I can use any neural network, for example, any, any a, a GRU or an LSTM. So it, we use an LSTM given stochastic excitation uh, we could produce the output. Here I will show you two results for two different excitations for the degrees of freedom of, the, of, uh, of this destroyer. Now, after I train offline the LSTM, I can produce this in 0.01 second instead of one week. So these things can be useful, can be used in real time for autonomy. I was interested in something more ambitious, actually. I wanted to develop um, neural networks for operators. So I was looking at something like this, where we have a neuron, we have the inputs, and then we have the soma here in the trunk, and then I have the postsynaptic signal. So not didn't quite do that, but but Deponet and, and the new uh, the new uh, the neural operator I will describe it's, it has this characteristic, it has a branch network which is related to the input. That's the branch. It's the branch. And then it has the out the output associated the output space is basically a trunk, so I call it the trunk net. And then of course they work together to give you the output here uh, with this inner product. I will explain this a little further. But what I'm talking about is we abandoning the paradigm from function. And we go to operators. We go from finite dimensional space to infinite dimensional Banach space. Of course, the possibilities then are. Uh, 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 numerous because we can do math, we can do dynamical systems, we can do black box systems and so on, we can do systems of systems. From uh, my good fortune, uh, I trace the Chen and Chen literature and they didn't have lots of papers, but they had this other jewel, jewel number two, two years later, they published this theorem that actually uh, uh, shows an approximation result for operators. So again, if G here, is the nonlinear continuous operator that you're looking at, you're looking for, and you are in a comp you have you draw functions u, the input from a compact set V, 
then this expression now, you can see a double summation here or triple summation is the approximation result. In other words, we sample U, okay, in M sensors. So this is now, you can see, we do a sigma on that. And then that's my input space. And then my output space is like this. So you can think of this as a basis phi, phi k of y. And you can see this whole thing here as alpha k. So basically I have a sum of k equals one to p of alpha k, phi k of the output space of y. And alpha k is related to the input. Now this is of course a familiar um, basis type of expansion that I showed you earlier. So one can uh, do lots of things with it. Now, first, because Chen and Shen didn't implement this, we wanted to find a, an architecture that will do that. So we try a few things. This term here now is associated with a branch. This here is the trunk, and then they cross and they work together. Unfortunately, when you learn operators, you have many parameters. So you run into the curse of dimensionality in the input space. Uh, so we wanted to go deep. In order to go deep, you have to have a theorem. So we derive a new theorem, we extended the theorem, let's say, of Chen and Chen, uh, for where we replace the single layers with deep neural networks. Going deep, of course, could alleviate. And in this case, we show theoretically, so uh, if I have time, I'll, I'll demonstrate that. We show theoretically that you eliminate the curse, you tackle the curse of dimensionality in the input space. Uh, having deep neural networks. The proof that we provided here in this paper, Nature Machine Intelligence, uh, is actually very different, much simpler than the original. We do it by construction, much simpler than the original proof for a single layer from uh, Chen and Chen. Nevertheless, all the credit goes to Chen and Chen. Um, so let me demonstrate what we're talking about. We're talking about, uh, let's look at this panel beam. We're talking about taking a, a function u of x, j, j from one to m here, uh, and then observe the function at the output. Now, of course, this would not work if we have to observe the function at the 100 points. It turns out, and that's what we observed early on, is that you have to characterize your inputs with lots of sensors, but actually you only have to do a couple of experiments at the output, okay? And then after you're done, we go here, after you've, you finish the training, then you, are, you give me a new excitation from that space V or outside the distribution. The question is, how good is the answer? How good is the generalization? It's all about generalization and what architecture will do the best. So let's look at this operator zero to X D tau here. And we take this integrand to be uh, different functions. Now these functions have to come from a space V. From that space, I take a Gauss random field. I kind of cheat here because a Gauss random field is not a compact uh, set, but, um, but it worked. It worked and then later on, uh, we had theory that shows that we can remove actually this, this constraint. For the proof uh, of Chen and Chen, V needed to be a compact set, but it doesn't need to be. Okay, so here we take 10,000. So I take 10,000 different U functions to integrate. And then I find the output S of X only at one point S X naught. Now, X is from zero to, to one. It could be from zero to, to, to infinity if I do Laplace transforms, but I only have to observe the output at one point. And by doing that, you can see here the mean square error goes down. This is the architecture. This is now the error for new data and sin data. And you can see the generalization error the difference between train and testing is very small for this architecture. And we compare with sequence to sequence, LSTM, CNN, and so on. Uh, one can learn any operator. I like fractional PDEs. I like fractional operators. So I ask the question, can I learn a fractional de derivative so I don't have to compute it because it's expensive. So same idea, you feed in the system with lots of known functions, and then you can do um, uh, great things. Now, the reason I show this in particular is because uh, I did something different here. So anyway, if you, if you don't know what the Caputo fractional derivative, it looks like this is an integral. In fact, the derivative goes inside and there's a singular kernel. So it's not a trivial thing to learn, but you can learn it. Here's the mean square error versus training size. And um, again, my space V 
is this uh, line here, which is the Gauss random field. However, and, the, and this is the point I, why I show, I show this example is, is to demonstrate that the input space V where you draw functions, the hat from which you draw your functions is very, very important. Here, I parameterize that space with uh, spectral expansions. Let's render something else I call polyfractonomials, which would develop some sort of fractional powers of polynomials, orthogonal polynomials. But the point is by doing the proper by finding the proper input space V to train this deep net, you can gain a big order of, uh, an order of magnitude. Uh, let's see how much time I have. Okay, I still have time. So I want to show you another example uh, from physics. And uh, it, it's, it's a very simple example. Everybody can understand it. It's how you, you, you grow bubbles, okay? So we're looking at tiny bubbles, bigger bubbles, and much bigger bubbles. Bubbles, of course, are in engineering, in, in my biomedicine, and so on. But let's just be romantic here and think about bubbles, little bubbles. OK, so if I want to simulate bubbles, uh, large bubbles, there's an equation by Lord Rayleigh, Rayleigh plus A equation. And it's a, a nice equation, and so on. So the first question is, if I give this pressure difference between the bubble inside and outside the ambient, can I find? R of t. I can solve this equation in no time in MATLAB, no problem. So that's not really the issue. The issue I'm testing is, can Deponet learn this equation? So indeed, if I take this as an input and I take R of t as an output, Deponet can learn to, uh, to predict to infer the dynamics of this. In fact, can learn very accurately. This is three different cases of unseen data data that I didn't use my training. You can see the dynamics is not trivial because it has multi-ray dynamics. This bubble, given this arbitrary pressure distribution, uh, oscillates very fast and then, then the size may decay or may go up depending on the competition between the pressure difference and the, um, and the dissipation. So, so I get pretty good multi-ray um, dynamics with this. Um, I can do that with the LSTM, of course. LSTM is... is uh, is ideal for, for time series forecasting. And in fact, LSTM also does a good job, but I need to have 200 points per trajectory for training. If I go to 20 points per trajectory, LSTM totally misses the fast frequencies. And we know that the spectral bias uh, favors low frequencies. However, DeepoNet can learn with 20 points, can also learn. So it's basically I need 10 times less points for time series forecasting than LSTM and we have more. Uh, results on that. So I, I talked about small bubbles becoming growing bigger and bigger. And if I look at the um, mathematical problem here, in this regime, uh, this equation is good. Now, if you go to tiny bubbles, like nano bubbles, this is not good. So you have to do molecular dynamics, molecular dynamics simulation here. Molecular dynamics simulations are extremely expensive. Just one bubble, starting from one, this is the initial radius of the bubble at t equals zero. If that bubble is very, very small and it's growing, I need to do molecular dynamics. It takes about 48 hours on, the, on our cluster, uh, big cluster at uh, Brown. So, so I want to basically use um, Deponet as a surrogate to learn the molecular system. Of course, you can also learn this. I, I demonstrate that. But indeed, we show that for these nanobubbles and these stochastic fluctuations, we can actually learn also how these bubbles grow. Then we want to do it together. In other words, we want to have a multi-scale operator where I feed it with data in the continuum regime, in the molecular regime, and then you give me an arbitrary initial size of a bubble. I can tell you in 0.01 seconds how big is the bubble. So recently we published a paper where we show that indeed you can feed the the the, 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 the point I'm trying to make here is that you can feed the, the, the neural the neural operator with data which are noisy from one regime, uh, smooth on another regime, and then you can seamlessly interface it uh, without uh, looking uh, at anything specific. I'm almost done here. I just want to um, part with uh, a few points about the neural operators. Recently, some people at Caltech also developed something called the Fourier neural operator. Uh, it was a big deal about it. Uh, they made big claims. 
These are people who don't know fluids, but they said they solve the problem of turbulence and so on. In fact, Andrew Stewart, is, who is a great mathematician, he works with me in a, in a joint project. Nevertheless, made big, big claims. So we went back to see how good is FNO. It turns out that this um, FNO, which uses a trigonometric basis uh, and Fourier, Fourier transforms together with ResNet, is really a subcase of DeepOnet because DeepOnet is not just one neural operator. It is a plurality of neural operators. What do I, do I mean by that? So I talk about the trunk here and I talk about the branch here. This is the input. These are the dendrites to the neuron, right? So the inputs could be different, just like the real dendrites. It could be an FNN. It could be imaging data. So I use a CNN. It could be an RNN. Again, here on the trunk, I can have a trigonometric basis like the FNO, or I can have a PCA, or I can have a different types of inductive bias, which will give me the best adaptive basis. The difference between the neural operator deponent we propose and, and what is coming up now in the literature is that we actually have two different types of networks, a bunch of them for inputs. And I say a bunch because we can have more than one and another one for the output space. So that's why I said it's sort of a, it's a framework. It's not just one neural operator. Uh, I also want to mention this great work by uh, uh, Sid Misra from ETH and his student. Uh, they wrote this 120 pages paper on depot nets and they came up with some really rigorous results on, first they, they show that they can break Deponent breaks the case of dimensionality in approximating very general nonlinear operators. Then they remove the uh, need to have a, a compact space. Uh, they also uh, remove the uh, requirement of continuity. You can actually have discontinuous operators like the multi-scale operator I told you about from stochastic to deterministic. Uh, they also talk about um, the surprising result. How do you sample this multi-parameter, multi high-dimensional input space and random sampling was shown to be almost optimal. Um, they, there's also error estimates that I, I don't have time to go over, but basically they break down the error into three parts, the projection, uh, the approximation and the reconstruction in the output space. Uh, Deep, DeepMind wrote a two page paper explaining um, in Nature Machine Intelligence, they, they wrote, they wrote uh, explaining the use of DepotNet. And in fact, they, they were the first to say that DepotNet can be used also in other systems where we know nothing about black box systems like social dynamics uh, have the reference here. Uh, DepotNet is blazingly fast next to numerical solvers. In fact, for some hypersonic problems, if you're interested in, in very complex chemistry problems, we demonstrate 100,000 times speed up uh, compared to state of the art in, in CFD. Uh, and there's lots of things that I didn't talk about here, uh, like the optimization error, the generalization error and, and, and bounce on that. Um, there are groups, including my group, that are start uh, looking at this total error, not just the approximation error I talked about uh, here. Early on, NVIDIA has actually um, discovered this and they hire my, uh, my postdoc. Uh, and, and now NVIDIA, you can see here their CEO is giving a talk, uh, talking 15 minutes uh, about this. Um, this year, they have a, a new division, whole division working on pins and something called modulus, which is a parallel pins, similar to what you're trying to develop at the Institute. Um, and uh, they are interested in DepotNet. They are asking to uh, buy a perpetual license from Brown, which have a patent. Uh, so anyway, they... Um, they asked me to develop, and they asked me to develop this course uh, on deep learning for scientists and engineers, which will be free and that you can download in a couple of months from the website of NVIDIA. Uh, uh, and uh, I want to show you the, the, the course roadmap. We are almost done with this course. We teach all neural networks, but without cats and dogs, by the way. This is all about um, uh, scientific computing and, and, uh, and mathematics and physics. And um, nothing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm friends with both dogs and cats, but I'm just saying that we're not doing a, the, the standard thing that it's a different course. So we teach Python, we teach um, uh, PyTorch and the TensorFlow and also 
all the basics at this module. Then module two uh, uh, teaches about uh, uh, pins, uh, and uh, module three teach, uh, teaches about multi GPU parallel computing, and module four teaches about um, operator learning, neural operators, and uncertainty quantification. Then there's all these different projects. So everything will be for free uh, and different modules, so people around the world could uh, take uh, take them and uh, create their own. Uh, there we also teach a deep xd and we'll also teach uh, uh modulus the nvidia uh freeware so i'm done i just want to acknowledge the um uh the center the center films physics informed learning machines the first uh, big effort that we started i'm the director from the department of energy and recently we uh, started another big effort with caltech and stanford and utah on um uh, what's called the multi-university research initiative. I'm, I'm the director also on this one. And uh, Jerome Darpon, my good French collaborator is uh, and colleague is uh, part of this. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions and stay uh, for longer to, um, to discuss with you guys. Thank you very much, George. Very, very, very impressive uh, work and uh, some of it almost sounds like magic to me, but um, I'm <laughs> sure there are people that uh, uh, want to uh, ask some questions. If not, I will have a very naive one. Yes, I have one. Go ahead, Jean. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you very much for this nice talk. I, I have a question just for uh, to make sure that I have understood quite well. For example, for the case of the simple case of the Burgers equation, uh, what is exactly your training set? So you start from an initial condition. You want to solve a Burgers equation for initial for some initial condition, but to train your network, uh, do you need to have a, a several initial condition and the solution for some uh, problems? So you have the, so the value of the function for some typical initial condition in the, in the set, right? So you need to know the solution for some uh, typical initial condition, no. right? No, 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 no. no that, that's 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 that, that would be the depot net. But the um, thing of the uh, the example I show you, it was it was solving the uh, Berger's equation for a specific initial condition, which was that line of of dark crosses, black crosses at t equals zero. That's the initial condition. So. I, so, and then I had these boundary conditions, but I didn't have data on the boundary conditions uh, everywhere. So I was making the point that I can solve an initial value, boundary value problem with very sparse initial conditions and gappy boundary conditions, which I cannot do with, uh, with um, any method like finite element or so on, because I don't have, uh, I don't have boundary conditions everywhere. So, so that's all I need, because remember, and that's what the idea of pins is. I use the equation. So, so I generate data from the equations. So my training data for that network actually is the equation because I evaluate this equation at many, many points. And, and the data is, the target is to make the residual of this equation be zero. Okay. Now, so you have two targets. One is your predicted neural network uh, values for the boundaries and the initial conditions should match whatever you, you are given. And the other target, the big one, is to make sure that the, you satisfy the equations at all these random points. So you mean that- by, by doing that, you improvise for anything that is missing. So, so in some sense, you can think of this as a collocation method with, with initial conditions and boundary conditions. So for example, for, for the weights, so you use the weight, and the, the, you propagate through the equation, and then you, the gradient of the, the stochastic gradient gives you improve the weights. Yes. That's, yes. That correct. You have a That's correct. Move. That's correct. And, and remember, I said I showed that schematic that shows the left, the data part of the of the network, and the and the and the physics part of the network. These are all parameterized by the same weights and, and biases, right? So it's the same theta. Yeah. So okay. I use the data from the physics which is basically, I know the residual has to be zero to satisfy the physics. That gives me the data that I don't have. Okay. Now, but because you asked the question, for depot net, I'm not doing that. The depot net is supervised learning. This was unsupervised learning. Depot net is, is really supervised learning. At least that's how we started. 
you give me data. So in that case, I need solutions. So you run your finite element code or whatever code you have, and you give me data and you give me the label output. And then, and then by minimizing that, I can, for, for different initial conditions, different boundary conditions and so on. And then deep on it, you don't train it. After, you're, after you train offline, online, you, never done, you don't optimize. You just, that's why it takes only 0.01 second to infer anything. So, so this, it's a basically deep on it is supervised learning. The other one is really unsupervised learning. It just that I, I generate data from the physics. Thank you. Yeah. Antonio, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for your nice talk. Um, I just was wondering, what about the, you, you talked about this difference in deep on it between the input and output sampling. So you said there was a much more uh, dense sampling in the, in the in, like input space versus the output space. Could you explain, uh, could you explain why? Uh, I wish I knew that. <laughs> that was a kind of fortunate result, but I think we actually realized that uh, I didn't show it, but if you look at our nature paper and also the paper I mentioned by um, Misra, we we don't we uh, observed exponential convergence. In other words, if I plot the MSC versus the training data, the training of the label data, the output, we observe exponential convergence, and then at some point it saturates, but exponential convergence. So. So the, uh, the theory also shows that um, for some mild conditions of smoothness, you can actually get exponential convergence and they establish that. So the fact that you have exponential convergence, you need, don't need a lot of data. Just like think of a Chebyshev, a Chebyshev um, expansion to, to, to approximate a, uh, a, um, the sign, the, let's say the sign, right? You need three points only. So it's the same thing. The exponential convergence is behind this. But but yes, uh, that, that was something that we observed empirically, and then it was it was now um, being documented uh, by a paper from Israel, and also more recently, if you follow mathematics, Christoph Schwab uh, from ETH also independently with another method uh, demonstrate that. And that's a key. That's actually a key. Otherwise, if you have to do so many experiments, you, you need a lot of labeled data. Then, then you know. Then you have a complex operator, and you parameterize the operator. You run into the scarce of dimensionality, and uh, and you cannot do it. But that was a, that was a key for for the operator regression. Great, thanks. Yes, sir. Yes. So, uh, in in scientific computing, usually for I, I mean finite elements or this kind of method. People are talking about elliptic, hyperbolic, um, or parabolic equations, and uh, I was wondering, in your experience, uh, is this way of uh, describing equation is it relevant for pins? Uh, do you have uh, some hyperparameters that are the same within one of those class, or, or pin is uh, very general and does not need to know which equation it is working on? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. The um, it doesn't, yeah, and, and actually that's what you know. I come from that background, so I, I was thinking along these lines. In other words, I would say, you know, can I, can I, for example, can I do meta learning and and have one set of hyperparameters for elliptic, one for parabolic, one for hyperbolic? It doesn't really work like that, um, and uh, it, it's more like the approximation properties of um, of of uh, the neural networks and, and, and you know, neural networks suffer from what's called the spectral bias. Basically, they would resolve the low frequency, but they would not do the high frequencies. So how would you solve multi-scale problems? How do you solve wave, wave propagation and so on with high frequencies? So, so to that effect, uh, we started, um, my group and other groups uh, talk about multi-scale and inductive bias and how you can put a, an extra layer in the input that targets a certain frequency. Let's say you're lo looking at uh, wave propagation mega and you're in the megahertz, right? Uh, you can have sines and cosines as the inputs to bias the neural network to towards the megahertz. Otherwise it will start from one hertz. How will go from one hertz all the way to megahertz? But if you bias from megahertz, you stay in that band of frequency. So, so that's all that, that was one of the spectral bias. The other one is of course, 
the uh, um, discontinuous solutions for high speed flows, shocks, and stuff like that. So, so we we publish the paper. It's very difficult for chaotic systems, uh, and also for discontinuous solutions. We we had some difficulties. We have some difficulties, but the adaptive basis that I demonstrated does a good job on that. Uh, then you can uh, the adaptive activation functions. We have a paper now for multi-dimensional shocks that we show unless you do uh, adaptive activation functions, you cannot actually re resolve it. So adaptive activation functions are very important. Remember I talked about the chronic, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. but just the adaptive activation function, you can, and it could be very simple. For example, you take hyperbolic tangent and make the slope of hyperbolic tangent a parameter different for each neuron okay. or different for, for each, uh, now you say, well, you, you include an, another 10,000 parameters, but I already have 100,000 parameters. So, <laughs> so another 10 doesn't. And, and by doing that, you actually tackle both problems, the, the spectral bias and also this, the stiffness. And then there was another issue with um, steep boundary layers, which uh, like boundary value problems would, would give you, right? Uh, elliptic equations uh, with very, very small epsilon, let's say. The, the trick of, of, of the, the, the self-adaptive weights in front of the boundary terms that uh, clever Ulysses introduced uh, actually <laughs> solves that problem. Okay. Uh, there, there are still difficulties if you're trying to do like the kuramoto Zivazinski, like a chaotic system in time, they're still difficult. So, so I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't I wouldn't rush to replace the forward solvers, my spectral solvers with pins because you know, they are very, very accurate spectral, you know, existing methods and, and finite element methods. But these pins work very well the moment you have some data, the moment you have some measurements, because that helps the optimization. Of course, the bottleneck here is the optimization, right? That, but if you have some data, then we can do the optimization very, very, very well. And so it seems that, okay. that if, if, in other words, if you have a boundary value problem, even if you don't have data at the boundary and you have some measurements inside the domain, Excellent. random. Yes, it works really, really well. Nobody can beat that. Uh, we have we have a paper that's coming up in uh, in a week in Science Advances where we have a, a porous material, okay, and for very few measurements we can find out the porosity of the material, and 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 do a test. Um, the hyperelastics like rubber with porous or something. That problem cannot be solved. Uh, it's the inverse problem. The forward problem, we take an hour to solve. Abacus, the finite element, takes 10 minutes to solve. But the inverse problem that we're looking at takes a year for Abacus. It takes an hour, still an hour, for us to solve. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if I if I were to advocate the use of these pins, I would say for hybrid problems for which you have some measurements and some physics. Okay. I, I would I wouldn't recommend people to just say, okay, abandon what you're doing for the forward solvers and, and start doing pins. That's not. Uh, so I know some people try to do that, and and that, you know any, anybody can do whatever they want. And but at this point in 2022, early, uh, we still don't have the fidelity in the optimization solvers to get to the accuracy that we want. Yeah. Classification is different. People who do classification is different, right? Because they, they don't care about 10 to minus seven accuracy. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So that was, uh, maybe if, if, if you allow me, uh, just a very short question. Do you rely on a um, simple optimizer like Adam or? or... Yeah, Adam, we, we do Adam and LPFGS. LPFGS. We start with Adam. Oh, yes. We go close and then we, we finish it up with LBFGS. Yeah. That in all our papers is like that. Um, I try very hard with different methods. I just used this week another method that also do, does the angle. There's mm -hmm. a paper that, that you can also uh, do the angle, not just the, uh, and, and it's an enhancement on Adam. Uh, you need to, do, to go from Adam, which is uh, very, kind of RMS prop works very, very well sometimes. For when you have whole oh, yes, okay. but eventually I, I need to go to Adam to uh, LBFGS. Yeah. Okay. So so second order method or um, uh, maybe good in in this kind of uh, problem. After so, after, you, after you get there. In other words, you you have to go very close to the Alps to see the peaks <laughs> or the valleys. <laughs> so Adam will take you there from okay. Toulouse. <laughs> you know, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes.
are there other other questions i realize i have to i have to unfortunately go and i know serge uh, has more things to ask you and serge's group uh mathieu okay mathieu please um mathieu chalvidal thank you hi professor thank you for this uh, interesting talk um i have a question around the the computation uh, mechanism or, or around those two uh, the interaction between the, the branch and, and trunk nets um i was wondering if you if you how you came up with the the this uh, this way of controlling the the uh, the trunk network uh with respect to the, the the inputs that you are trying to to fit uh with this multiplicative term between the, the branch and the trunk activations and if you have tried to to other forms of of controlling the the trunk net uh with the um, with the branch uh, uh, part of your system? Um, the, the theory, actually, that was, that was not my idea. It was the theorem of that I, I discovered, this paper I mentioned, uh, the second by Chen and Chen, had the approximation theorem. So that, that's sort of suggestive on how to build it. So we build a network like that because, because it had th those two networks working in sync. So the question was, if you look at our paper in Nature Machine Intelligence, we examined four different architectures, how to rearrange, and we found this, this one that I show you to provide the, the, the smallest generalization error, and also leads to exponential convergence. Uh, I talk about exponential convergence, and we noticed that at some point, if the training data is large, this exponential convergence switches to one over square root of n, just like sampling, right, which you expect from the beginning. So. I don't think we have actually the optimum architecture yet to tell, tell you the truth. So I believe that there is an architecture out there that somebody, some one of you will, will discover which will be better than this one. But this one was good enough to, to show us some of the um, uh, attributes of the network and then develop some theory around it. Uh, the, 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 in a recent paper, we just uh, submitted, uh, there's a paper on, um, was just accepted. We have a, the title is a fair and, co and comprehensive comparison between neural operators uh, with practical extensions for fair data. So there, we're trying to be really careful and compare with FNO and other operators. And, uh, and, and, and there we experiment a lot with what you suggested, how you can have a different branch and different trunk and working together if that affects the Solution and indeed we found certain things. For example, we had to normalize also the outputs, not just the inputs. We also found that if you use something clever in the trunk, which will relate to the input, for example, let's say you have uh, a time series, you have a PDE in time, right? And you take snapshots and you do a POD modes, PCA modes, and you feed that into the trunk from the input, from the branch of the trunk. It turns out that that works really, really well in many problems. It, it trains well, the accuracy is very good. We beat the, uh, the state of the art by orders of magnitude. So what you're suggesting is actually very interesting, but I don't have the answer, um, at least a systematic answer. What we have in that paper is some empirical evidence that yes, it's good to tweak one with respect to the other and 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 be mindful of that. So the example I gave you, there, there are a few examples that that uh, doesn't always work, unfortunately. But uh, but there may be some uh, scientific computing issues, not not conceptual issues. I think I think uh, the, the the inductive bias that you could put in the trunk should be influenced by the the input to the branch. That's sort of a, a statement I could do, which you basically you suggested, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, George, for all of this. I think um, we're going to let you be with with Serge and his group a little bit longer, uh, so you guys can discuss more. Uh, thanks again for a really great talk, very inspirational. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Adios. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye.